Hello, I'm Joseph Zodl. Welcome to our discussion of the electoral vote. We'll discuss how it came to be, how it works, why it won't be changed anytime soon, and the question has come before us for 2024. Can the state legislatures choose the electors instead of the voters? In fact, can the voters make a choice and then can the state legislature overrule that choice and pick electors for somebody else than the candidate the voters picked? Below you'll find a link for a set of PowerPoint slides to follow along, which I encourage you to download and keep for reference, as well as a link to a bookmarked copy of the Constitution. You'll also see a link to Amazon. As you see, I have some books for sale, and that will give you an entire list. I hope you find something you like. If you don't, you can still buy me a coffee through that link if you feel I've earned it. But be sure to subscribe and click the notifications bell to be alerted of more videos like this coming soon. So if you go to our first content slide, the question is, is there an electoral college? And our answer is, well, there's no such thing mentioned in the Constitution anywhere. The Constitution does discuss electors and electoral votes, yes, but it doesn't use the phrase electoral college. That's a phrase that has come up as popular usage over the years. So I give you that information to be complete, and also maybe it'll help you win a bar bet someday. If we go to the next slide, why electoral votes in the first place? Why not a popular vote of the people or something else? We have to go to 1787 and the Constitutional Convention and its design of the legislative branch. New Jersey, which was a small population state at the time, felt that the correct way to set up the legislative branch, the fair way, would be each state should have equal representation, as we would be a union of states. Virginia came up with a plan that said, no, it should be by population that it should be based on the larger states being able to have more of a voice because they had more Americans. Now, just as an aside, this did come out of Virginia, which was a southern state and a slave state. As a result of another compromise, slaves would have been considered three-fifths of a person for purposes of choosing the House of Representatives, for purposes of apportionment. That was a compromise between North and South. Now the question becomes, how do we elect the president in the executive branch? Should that be by a popular vote? Should it be by the state legislature deciding? Well, the compromise we'll see later on was to allow the state legislature to set up the system for their specific state. But very quickly, it became a popular vote system to choose candidates for elector to become electors. That is, from among the candidates running for elector, X amount will be chosen from your state. As we are starting to get into issues, we see a split between some of the factions in Congress and elsewhere in the political scene at the time. Jefferson and Adams both were very much in favor of independence at the Continental Congress, uh, but they had different ideas about how the country should be run. So you begin to have factions backing one side or another, or those become political parties. So now, instead of the people choosing who should be the electors who will make this wise decision as to who should be president and vice president. Now it's a matter of you choosing among candidates who are running supporting these candidates for president and vice president or these other candidates for president and vice president as we have today. So today you have candidates for elector pledged to the Democratic candidates, pledged to the Republican candidates, Libertarian, Green Party, and so on. The number of electoral votes, it was decided, should be a compromise based on how the legislative branch was set up. So every state has two electoral votes for being a state. And additional electoral votes are, are assigned based on the number of representatives. With each state having one representative, the smallest states therefore have three electoral votes. Today, we have a total of 538 electors, 435 based on the number of representatives in Congress, 100 based on the two senators from each of the 50 states, and then there are three more from the District of Columbia, which were assigned to the District of Columbia under the 23rd Amendment. So we have 5 to 38. So half of that would be 269 and a half, so we have to round up. To win the presidency and the vice presidency, you need 270 electoral votes. And these days we have candidates running saying, I'm for this person as president, I'm for that person as president, and we expect them to fulfill their duty. Sometimes we have some rogue electors. 
Rogue electors are those who are pledged to a particular candidate, but vote for somebody else, perhaps even a relatively unknown person, uh, for whatever reasons. And some states have said, well, we should have a state law that requires that the candidates who are chosen elected by the voters of the state shall vote for the person they were pledged to and nobody else. Now, I have two problems with that. One is, what do you do if they don't follow the law? What if they do become rogue electors anyway? Well, do you send them to prison? Do you levy a fine on them? Either way, they already cast the vote. So how do you change the vote they already cast? It doesn't really address the problem. And the difficulty when states do it is because the choice of electors is set up in the U.S. Constitution and their duties are set up in the Constitution. The only way you can change it is by amending the Constitution which is not going to happen anytime soon, and we'll get into that. But we do occasionally have the rogue elector. An elector is not required to vote for the person they were pledged to. Usually they do. So that's an outline to the Electoral College itself. Now, why will it not be replaced? If you go to the next slide, we see California, very popular state, 52 representatives and two senators, they have 54 electoral votes. And what did we say was required to win? 270. So they have about a fifth of the votes you need to become president or vice president right there. California has a lot of power. You also look at Texas, kind of a similar situation. They carry a lot of weight in the Electoral College. But let's look at Wyoming. In Wyoming, you only have 576,000 people. Well, they have one representative being one of the smaller population states and two senators. That gives them three electoral votes. So some people might say, well, three out of 538, that's not that important. I am of the school that says every vote can count. So why will it not be replaced? California and Texas are not interested in changing the system because they have so much power. So you have the Democrats prevail generally in California and the Republicans generally in Texas. The California Democrats do not want anything passed that will reduce their ability to deliver the 54 electoral votes that make a difference in the presidential election. The Republicans in Texas will not allow a change to the 40 electors that will help decide the next president or vice president. They have the power and they get paid attention to. Well, Wyoming only has three electors. So in itself, that doesn't seem like a lot of power, but take a look there on the right side and you see how many people there are per elector. And we see California and Texas, a lot of people per elector. But in Wyoming, it's only 192,000 people per elector. So they're down to a very small number of people per electoral vote that they cast. So the small states are not too interested in giving up the disproportionate power that they have per elector. Here's how California went on the next slide in 2022. And here's how Texas went in 2022. So the Democrats definitely have a hold on California and Texas, they seem to have a pretty good hold on the Republican side. So reasons why it will not be replaced. Here are some ideas. One is you make the popular vote binding on electors, which we discussed, would have to be done on a level of a constitutional amendment. Uh, there's also a theory about replacing the electors just with votes. Now, what I mean by this is that at present, the Secretary of State of your state certifies who won the popular vote, and that's who gets all the electors. Those electors meet. You could have a rogue elector. That vote is what is reported to Washington, which the Congress counts in the presence of the President of the Senate, the Vice President of the United States, in January. The idea of replacing the people with the votes is simply, instead of going through all those steps, the Secretary of State will simply certify who won the state, assigns them the electoral votes, sends that into Washington, and we skip over the electors meeting because if the electors are already pledged and should support the person they're pledged to, do we really need to get them to get together and hold a meeting? Because they hold public office. They are candidates, they were chosen for this office, and they meet to do one thing cast their electoral vote and they go home. And it's a ceremony, the governor usually speaks and they do the Pledge of Allegiance, other things you would expect. But they are in an office for more than about an hour. So can we just replace the people uh, with 
electoral votes that are sent directly to Washington. That's it that's been thrown around. Other possibilities is a majority of popular vote. If we have a majority of popular vote, what happens if nobody gets a majority? Well, we could say, well, Congress will decide. Or we could say, we'll have a runoff among the top two if there's no majority. So if you have one candidate wins 49%, another candidate wins 48%, and somebody else gets the remaining 3%, we eliminate that third person and just have a runoff between the top two. And should this be done nationally or by region or by state? Or how should this be set up? It gets kind of complicated. If we propose to replace the electors with only the votes themselves, that is to say, the Secretary of State submits to Congress, here's how our electoral votes came out. Most people will agree that it's not doing any harm, and it does prevent the rogue electors. But the moment you start suggesting making changes, people start coming up with these other ideas and start saying, well, if we're going to make some changes, let's do all the changes we need to really get it right. And in order to make the change, you have to get two thirds of each House of Congress to agree on the change. That's to propose it to the states. Then you need three quarters of the states to ratify the amendment. And we can't get enough people to agree in the first place. So the moment you open the door, let's get rid of the rogue electors by eliminating the people voting and just send the votes into Washington as certified by the Secretary of State, all these other ideas start coming onto the table. And whatever you propose, it's unlikely that the large states will accept the idea. The senators and representatives probably not vote for it. The members of the legislature will probably not vote for it, at least in the prevailing party, because then you have votes that wash, for example, in California, once the Democrats win the state. The Democrats get all the electoral votes we're done. If you do it by population, the millions of votes the Republicans got would still count towards the grand total, along with Texas and other votes. And of course, the smaller states do not want to give up the power they have in the Electoral College. So we are probably not going to see a change anytime soon. Now, that brings us to the question, does any state legislature have the constitutional right to disallow a popular vote for the president and the vice president and name the electors itself? And my straight answer on this next slide is it depends. Here is a section of the Constitution that's re relevant. Each state shall appoint, in such manner as the legislature may direct, number of electors equal to the whole number of senators and representatives in which the state may be entitled to Congress. So if you go to the next slide, I have a highlight of that first part. The second part we've already discussed, and that's given at this point. Uh, it is perhaps worth mentioning that in 48 states plus D.C., it is true that whoever wins the most votes in the state gets all the electoral votes. In two states, Maine and Nebraska, it's a little bit different. Whoever carries the state gets two electoral votes. The remaining electoral votes are apportioned by congressional district. Who won a congressional district? So sometimes one candidate can carry the state even by a large margin, but there might be one or two congressional districts in which the opposition won. And so those candidates for electorate would be chosen. But it's only those two states that talk about doing it in other states, but it's only those two states that have it at this time. So each state shall appoint in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct a number of electors. Well, the state legislatures have set up popular votes that choose among candidates for elector to choose the electors for the state, which we've already discussed. So the state legislatures, the state legislature in your state, has the authority to dispense with having a popular vote for president and vice president and choosing electors from among the candidates and simply say, we, the legislature, will make the decision who those electors shall be. Or they can say the governor will choose the electors. Or they can say, you get to choose the electors. They could even come along and say, we are giving you all the power. You are going to be the elector who will cast all the electoral votes for our state. I would hate to be a member of the state legislature who did this, who was planning on running for re-election. Now, what we just said is valid. They can make the changes. The question then becomes, can they make the changes at any time they want to? Well, let's assume on our next slide, can, we've had the election. Candidate A won 300 electoral votes nationwide. Candidate B, 238. 
So candidate A has more than 270 votes and is the winner. Then we have some of the state legislatures decide to essentially tear up the Secretary of State's certification and say, we'll appoint electors ourselves who will vote for candidate B. So 32 votes move from candidate A over to candidate B. Candidate B gets 270 electoral votes. And the state legislators responsible for this have just changed the results of the electoral vote, even though the people voted for given electors. Now I'm talking about changing the results after the election, and there is a big difference between that, a real constitutional crisis, and changing the procedure before the election, and not before the campaign. We've already got a campaign going. But in 2024, before the first absentee ballot, mail-in ballot has been sent out, before early voting has started, before anybody can vote, I hold that the state legislature can change the procedures and they can say, we're going to cancel the popular vote in our state for president and vice president, and hence for the electors from our state, and we're going to do this instead. It is also possible to say, well, we'll go ahead with the popular vote, but we're only going to take that as advisory, and the legislature will still make the decision. Still political hot potatoes, but the question of constitutionality, I hold it would be constitutional. Again, I wouldn't want to run free election based on a platform that I voted to overturn the will of the people and have somebody else be your next president. That would not work well, but it could be done. Now, what if the absentee ballots have already been sent out? Well, that's a totally different thing. That means the game has started. Is it appropriate to change the rules of a game once the game has started? And you've been playing by a certain set of rules, and now I announce, I just changed all the rules, so I'm going to win. Well, that's not the right way to do it. That's not the American way to do it. And the Constitution says in the Fifth Amendment, no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And the Fourteenth Amendment says no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And your vote is part of your liberty. So if they change the rules of the game once the game has started, I hold without question that we have a constitutional issue that the state legislature no longer had the authority to do that once the voting started, once the first ballot was sent out to be in the hands of a mail-in or absentee voter. So that's a sticky sort of thing right there. But supposing that they do it after the election and the Secretary of State has already sent in certification. Now, two sets of electoral votes show up in Washington to be counted by the Congress. This is a joint session of the House and the Senate together. So we go to our next slide. Candidate A, 300 electoral votes. Candidate B, 238 electoral votes. However, we have two sets of electoral votes from some states, which is a total of 32. So how do we handle this one? If Congress can't decide well, then we can't count those votes. Well, what happened is, as we saw in 2020, each house adjourns to its own chamber and they will vote on which set of electoral votes to accept. But we have a slight Democratic majority in the Senate and a slight Republican majority in the House. Um, if everyone stays with their party, they're going to come out with two different results of which set of electoral votes should be counted. If Congress can't decide, then they can't be counted. We got uh, two conflicting sets of votes. So those will then be disregarded. So if 32 electoral votes are disregarded, then we have candidate A is down to 260 electoral votes, candidate B, 238 electoral votes in our model. So no one is 270, so no one's been elected. On the next slide, what happens next? From the top three candidates, the Senate votes on who the vice president will be, and each senator has one vote, so 100 votes total. The House votes on who the president will be, um, and that is based on each state having one vote. So Wyoming has one Republican representative. That Republican representative will decide how Wyoming's one vote will be cast. That Republican representative might say, I'll stay with my party and I'll vote for the Republican. Or might say, well, gee, this year the Democrats really carried the state, so if I go by the will of the people, then I should vote for the Democrat. And then the question becomes, but who won the popular vote nationally? Maybe you should go with that. 
but let's assume that everybody stays with their party. Wyoming, one vote. California, one vote. We have 52 representatives from California who will meet in a conference room to decide how to cast California's one vote. 54 electoral votes have now been replaced with one vote in the House. With the majority of Democrats, if everyone stays with their party, that one California vote should be for the Democrat. But we still don't know if everyone will stay with their party. Added to that, by this point, we can expect some horse trading. Someone gets told, if you switch your vote over this way and we win, you are the new Secretary of State or the new Ambassador to France. This is a last-ditch effort to try to make a decision as per the Constitution if nothing else worked. What happens if nobody prevails? What happens if you have a 50-50 tie in the Senate and a 25-25 tie in the House? Now, nobody's been elected. We go back and we try it again, and we go back and we try it again, and we go back and try it again until eventually we would have a president and a vice president chosen. In the meantime, the clock has been ticking from November to general election day through December when the electors meet in their various states to January when the votes are counted in Washington by the joint session of Congress. And it's after that, after that, when we only have days before the inauguration day, that decision has to be made, should be made. And what if it isn't? Does the existing president just hang on to office in the meantime? Let's say a decision isn't made till March. No, we really wouldn't have a president. We really wouldn't have a vice president. Because the 20th Amendment dictates that the terms of the president and the vice president shall expire at 12 o'clock noon on January 20th. So if there's no successor, the president and vice president don't stay in office. There's nobody in office. So then we can pull out the Presidential Succession Act that says, well, then the Speaker of the House is next, the President pro tempore of the Senate after that, and so on. But I hope I've been able to give you a good summary of something that will be one big mess if that happens. I personally would like to see the popular vote continue, and whichever candidate gets the most votes, either statewide or using Maine and Nebraska system, whoever gets the most votes gets the electors. And I would like to see something that makes sure we don't have rogue electors. And to me, just eliminating the people and just counting the electoral votes as such is the easiest way to do it. But like I say, that opens up a whole thing about all these other ideas. And in our last slide is the quotation from the Constitution about the counting of the ballots, because we had some controversy in 2020. The President of the Senate shall, in the presence of the Senate and House of Representatives, open all the certificates and the votes shall then be counted. It doesn't say he makes the decision which votes will be accepted. That is up to Congress under the Electoral Vote Act, the statute that explains in detail well, what happens if we have a problem. Well, we'll do this. But the President of the Senate, who is the Vice President of the United States, doesn't have the authority to be anything but the presiding officer over the count. So this concludes our discussion for today on the electoral vote. We will have more videos like this later on. So if you like this one, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell so you don't miss the new videos coming soon. And click the like button because that helps publicize our channel. Thank you for joining me today.